And that's a function of the world in which we live, where we don't often, we are brought up in a reward and punishment society where when we do something bad, we are through Calvinism and um, Puritanism, which is what the um, philosophy that has kind of informed the way we think about things, in the, particularly in the US and to some degree in Canada, um, that if you've done something bad, you are bad, you're a, you're a bad person. And it's very painful to all of a sudden, uh, can, like have the thought that, oh, I, I might, in quotation marks, be going to hell. Welcome to Happy to Offend You. Life guarantees that somebody's going to be offended by anything that you do. In fact, somebody right now is offended by life itself, but they don't have to be. This show guarantees that someone is going to be liberated from being offended by somebody else's offensive behavior. But yes, we said it. This show sets out to prove not only how to be liberated from being offended, and also how to be happy to offend. So if you're already offended, welcome to the show. And here's your host of the very offensive, Michelle Nedelec. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec. Welcome to Happy to Offend You, where you get to unravel or unveil why the why behind the mystery that just because you're offended by someone doesn't mean that you're going to die. And in fact, if you understand why they're not offended by the things that they do, we can actually create better connections with one another. So I am here with my most offensive guest. <laughs> 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 Again, another sweetheart that you guys are going to love to meet. So welcome to the show, Sheila. Thank you. Welcome. Um, welcome to you, Michelle, into my <laughs> office space here. <laughs> Love it. So give everybody the highlight of who you are and what you do for business. I'm the entrepreneur's therapist. So I support mostly women, business owners, solopreneurs, self-employed folks, micro business owners uh, with their mental and emotional well-being because business is a roller is an emotional roller coaster. And we're living in an era of relentless stressors that make you want to lose your crap on the daily. <laughs> exactly. So one of the things that we were talking about earlier in, in understanding kind of the, the power of being happy to offend you is the idea or notion of kind of understanding who you are, what you represent in the world, that somebody's going to be offended by it no matter what, and that we can't go around walking on eggshells in fear of what other people think of us. And we have to be proud of the stance that we take. So tell us a little bit more about kind of how that all resonates with you and uh, what your stand is on that. Well, I've always been a very political, small p political person. I have a particular analysis of the world and, the, and systems in particular and how systems operate in the world and have an impact on us. Uh, and how the further away we are from straight, white, uh, cisgender male, the more the, the less the systems are, that exist are constructed in our favor and the more they disadvantage us. So I've always been offensive. <laughs> my, my, my point of view, my way of seeing the world, my way and my way of operating because that point of view informs what I think what I see, what I say, how I behave. And so, you know, pe people are offended by me all the time, not, not because I'm an asshole, because I, but because it puts into question what they think. And for many folks, when they're in firmly positioned in what some folks might call the dominant culture and other fo folks like in the Jungian tradition would call the over culture, that is to say, the main way, the mainstream way things are, the more you're embedded in that, um, the more difficult it is to see outside that and the more of a shock it is to see what, see to see, like it's like you're a fish in water and somebody suddenly says, dude, you're a fish and you're in water and you're like, what the fuck? I'm not a fish. This is not water. What are you talking about, right? It's shocking and upsetting and destabilizing to, to, to be brought face to face with those things. And that's just who I am and who I've always been as a person. And I've had to be willing to accept that, um, that, that re like to not accept, what's the word? Let me pause for a moment. To not be thrown off my foundation by other people's reactions to my way of being. And when it comes to my business, and it comes to mental health, um, 
I'm going to pause again to for the words to come. Somebody once said around niching um, that the clearer you are about the message, the easier it is for your people to find you. And the image that comes to me as like um, light in a fog, and if and it's diffused. But if you have if you have um, if it's a lighthouse, then it's a it's like the tractor beam from the Death Star to ma to mix metaphors, and it just. <laughs> People I don't know if you know want to be sucked into the Death Star, which, <laughs> right? But they know directly which way to go. That the mm -hmm. that the attraction mm -hmm. is what gives the impetus to bring people in that direction. And for some folks, what I offer cre in, are the conditions for safety for their own mental and emotional well being, and that sense of like maybe this is safe for me here where there is so much danger and harm for me in the dominant culture, I'm willing to quote unquote, offend folks who identify with the dominant culture because there's lots of resources for them. There are plenty of, of, of opportunities, plenty of supports. And I want to be that haven for folks who have less, fewer, fewer things that are less, fewer options that are tailored to what they need for their own safety. So I'm okay to exclude in quotation marks by offending in quotation marks by standing firmly in my values, right? So explain to me one thing, because I've kind of grown up in a male dominated world, a very white male dominated world. Mm. And I just went, oh, okay, those are the rules of the game. I can play. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. it wasn't that I was playing with the rules. It was, I'm me, this is who I am, like it or leave it. This is your issue. Because yeah. in that world, that's how they all played. And I just went, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. so I'm me and yeah. this is the way this is going down. But yeah. people seem to be very offended by that <laughs> lately. And I, I'm i kind of going, you know, I get it, but I don't get it. It was like the whole, that whole system to me said, stand up for yourself, know who you are and bring it. It was, it was very offensive and very aggressive <laughs> to get mm -hmm. that part, but but why are people offended by everything right now? Because to me, it doesn't serve and support you in any way, shape or form, because then you don't understand the, the word lexicon comes to mind. I don't even know what that means right offhand, but I'm going, you don't understand like the nuances of everything that's going on in, in the world and how beneficial it can be to, to find out kind of why somebody does the things that they do and and that there's things that you can leverage and, and things that you go, yeah, I'm leaving that one behind. I don't care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I would challenge the assumption that everybody's offended by everything right now. Like, I know you're saying <laughs> it to make a point, right? And I'm going to dispute that. I'm going to dispute that. Please do. Absolutely. Um, do. What I would say is that folks are challenging more, are challenging harmful behavior more. Folks are less willing to put up with things that are harmful. People are more willing to say, stop it, that hurts. People are wanting, I think, those folks who are saying those things, and maybe even folks who aren't saying things, are wanting a world where we can all flourish without having to fight upstream. Right. And so what, if I could be so bold, I it think it's the place to do there, that. <laughs> yes. Your experience of having the capacity to be a woman in a woman's assist gender female body in a man's world and to be able to, to have the capacity to say, well, I'm just going to take what works for me and leave the rest. And I'm really going to be firm and fierce and not take shit from anybody is very firmly rooted in a whole bunch of privilege uh, or, or to use a different absolutely. word, adva advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And Why if not? you've ever seen that, the, the graphic that I really love is the one of the fence, uh, people looking at, um, there's a fence between people and a playing field, a, ba a baseball diamond. Yep. And it shows the people on the different size boxes, right? And that that the higher up the box you're standing on, the less the fence obscures your view of the field, yep. right? 
And so I, I, as a trauma survivor and a Jewish woman and an older woman Mm -hmm. coming into a workplace that is male dominated, which is, uh, and, and is white centric and um, has men with PhDs and multi zero salaries, my capacity, what it would take for me to navigate that. I have the intelligence. I have the education. I certainly have the confidence, but the toll on me to navigate that is more than I want to pay. And I I would like to have a world in which none of us has to fight upstream in that way. And I mean, even in your privilege, you had to work hard to, um, to like, what's the word I would say, to sort and discard, right? Like you had to work really hard at filtering and figuring things out. And, um, and that, and that, and that takes a lot. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be, I would wish for a world in which you didn't have to work, that none of us had to work that hard, that we had consideration for one another as human beings, and that we were checking in with one another about how can we together figure this out instead of saying, this is the way, and you either conform to the way or you're fucked, basically. (laughs) Right. Which is which is the power, I think, of this conversation, because it's understanding that I naturally have a a rebellious attitude, which has been nurtured (laughs) through that whole thing, which then comes back to the idea of the peaceful resolution is I've just potentially felt like a salmon going upstream and it's like, well, this is it's just what you do. This is how you get to the breeding ground. <laughs> this is, you're, you're not, you can't go downhill to the breeding ground because it's up there. Uh, so it's um, for but sure. Some people are going down. That... Some people What's are that? going down to the breeding ground yeah. and that's kind of the point. Carry on. Explain more. Well, that's it. That's it. Like, I mean, but explain the metaphor because I think a lot of people don't understand that, that just because this is the way we've understood it for so long. We're not salmon. We're humans. We have a capacity to be able to, to understand and to meet people at different levels and different um, conversations. And for the most part, it's just to stop and say, you're right. Now, show me why you're right. And I'm listening. Because I think a lot of people just don't stop and listen and they don't see where other people are right. Yeah, it, I, <clears throat> the big thing is willingness. And I think that's what's missing. The big thing is willingness. We see this a lot in, for example, um, issues of uh, racism and white supremacy, where someone will say to someone, you have said or done something that was harmful to me or harmful in this situation. And the person who acted will receive that feedback as an attack on them, as on their moral value and worth as a human being. And that's a function of the world in which we live, where we don't often, we are brought up in a reward and punishment society where when we do something bad, we are through Calvinism and um, Puritanism, which is what the um, philosophy that has kind of informed the way we think about things, in the, particularly in the US and to some degree in Canada, um, that if you've done something bad, you are bad. You're a, you're a bad person. And it's very painful to all of a sudden uh, con- like have the thought that, oh, I-, I might, in quotation marks, be going to hell. And this happens on a visceral level, whether you're a religious person or not, that when you have a sense, you, bec- you have a shame attack and you, your worth, uh, you, your worth beca- and that's very, very, very hard, mm-hmm. very hard. And your everyday person who doesn't have insight into that is just going to go, what are you talking about? I didn't do that thing. That's not harmful. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, you, you know, you're wrong and I don't have to change at all. You know, get thee gone. I don't want to hear about this. This is not changing. This is the way it's going. And what's really needed there are actually, and this is a very complex and difficult process that needs a lot of support. So uh, it's much easier said than I'm going to just glibly said than, than it is done. Right. But the first thing is to recognize that there's a difference between 
the act and your worth as a human being, right? And to work on fundamental human worthiness that we are innately worthy as humans, regardless, just by virtue of being human, which again is flying in the face of uh, uh, Puritanism and Calvinism and Christianity because it believes in original sin. And again, you don't have to be religious to be affected by this, right? Mm -hmm. So the first step is to, is, to, is to really cultivate this sense of innate self valuing independent of your actions or external circumstances p.s the work of Kristen neff and self-compassion backed by research check it out that's very helpful in this and then the second thing is when you feel okay enough about your relationship with yourself then when somebody says you did something that hurt me you're of course taken aback but you're you're not all of a sudden thinking you're a shit human being and having a shame attack so then you have the capacity to say, oh, okay, I'm taken aback by that. I feel it in my belly. Like I'm, I'm remembering like times when people have said things to me. I feel this kind of squinchy in my belly and a little bit of adrenaline rush because this is a little like bold kind of confrontational conversation. So I'm just going to, you can see I'm placing my hand on my chest and you can't see I'm placing my hand on my belly too. I'm just taking a breath and saying, okay. Uh, I'm willing to hear more. And it might be that I'm too activated in this moment. And so if I can't get a grip on myself, because I'm having a little freak out, I can say to the person, I need to get a grip on myself in order to be able to hear you. I'm going to go away, get some, you know, get my shit in order so that I can hear you and come back. And then, and then you can say, can you tell me more? Or in this moment, you know, and because I'm trained in this and I've worked really hard at it, I'm usually pretty good at being able to say, can you tell me more? And then the, the step is to, is to reflect to the person and reflecting doesn't mean agreeing. It means telling them back what you think they said. And it's a comprehension exercise to make sure that whatever's going on in your head is not obscuring from you what they're actually trying to tell you. So you repeat to them what they're saying so that you make sure that you're getting what they're trying to tell you which again, doesn't mean you agree. It just means you're trying to get what they say. And that is such a, those three steps are such deep uh, personal growth skills that the vast majority of folks don't have that it's just easier and also more knee-jerk self-defense kind of to, to, to just be like, oh, no, I don't want to hear about that. You're that's not my frame of reference and you don't know what you're talking about. I'm the authority here or I'm the one who knows or whatever. I don't want to hear this. Get out of here. You know, I think that's why most people respond the way they do because it's hard, hard work to have the willingness and the capacity to respond differently. Absolutely. And I, and I appreciate that this is a passionate conversation because because it is, we all have, and then one of the ways that I've described it in the trainings that we do is we all have all of these buttons. We all look like the cockpit of a 747. <laughs> People are constantly pushing our buttons. And sometimes we don't know if they're being pushed or not. And even the idea of walking out of the room and going, hey, hold that thought, I'll be right back. We can think that we're offending the other person by walking away from them in the middle of a discussion. And it's like, well, no, they probably don't even care. Like you need your time to be able to do the thing that you need to do to be able to figure out where you're at so that you can have a place in this conversation if you so choose to. And you and have every a, right to do that. Yes, you do. And what's important is in the absence of information, the other person will make up stories about why you're doing what you're doing because that's <laughs> how we are as humans. So we do need to explain the intention in walking away. My intention in walking away is not to cause further harm in this moment, but to get resourced so that I can come back and have this conversation with you. But yes, absolutely. You have there. And, and it really does flaunt it. Happy to offend you. It flaunts <laughs> social convention to walk away. But in many cases, it's what we really need to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with everything you've said. And it's and I, and I say that in, I think it's important for people to understand that you can have a heated discussion and agree. It's <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing mm. wrong with that at mm. all. And in fact, when we can have those, that's it's um, 
well, we, when we, it may be that we have to get to a point where we have to understand why we're saying the things that we're saying um, in order to go, hey, I have a place to be able to say this. You have a place to be able to say anything you need to say. But in understanding, it's going to carry more weight when you've done your work and you've figured out why um, why you're having the, the discussions in those moments that you are, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good example, um, most recently, uh, this is August that we're recording this, August of 2023. Um, and there was an actor, Jamie Foxx, who used a phrase, they killed, the, they killed Jesus, in quotation marks. He used it in a tweet. And there was a huge Twitter storm around this. I'm not sure if you're aware of the, no. no. And this is like where understanding of context comes in. Right. Where uh, to understand his understanding of that phrase and the context in which that phrase is used in his community and what that phrase means historically in Christianity and what that phrase means as a result to Jews. Right. Right. And in order to have a conversation around the use of that phrase, people have to be able to, well, first of all, care for their emotional selves. Because I mean, you know, speaking as a Jew, it's terrifying. So right? <laughs> like if I'm going to want to hear from Jamie, let's say, about what, what was going on with him when he used that phrase, uh, and he's apologized for it, and I'm totally okay with what happened. I'm totally okay with how it, as a Jew for myself, I'm totally okay with the fact that somebody said to him, hey, dude, that's a problem. And he went, oh, really? Okay, I'm sorry. I see how it was harmful. I won't use it again. And that's that, like, for me, that's the end of the story. And I'm, ha and I'm, for me, for my own, not representing for all the Jewish people, just saying for myself <laughs> as a Jew, I'm okay. I want to say in the context of this conversation that I'm no longer, I don't have anything up in me around that situation. Mm. But at first, when I saw that phrase, like my stomach turned over, my breath caught in my throat. I, I really felt fear. I felt like like not anxiety, like fear. But, yeah. but if I was going to go up to Jamie Foxx and say, dude, like, I'm just really curious. And I just really want to understand. Not being sarcastic or ironic or anything, but like, really, I want to understand where were you going with that? Like, what was going on? Like, I have yeah. to be okay inside in order, because if I were freaking out, no matter what he said to me, it wouldn't come in. Right. Mm -hmm. So like the emotional side of things, we have to have that insight, like you say, and self-connection, um, self-leadership is another way people frame that right before mm -hmm. you can enter into that kind of difficult conversation. Well, do, do you know the backstory of that? Because now I'm fascinated. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure if I want to put a lot of energy into it or not, but well, I can give it to like, you. What would make you say it, that? It's um well it's because in the black the way I understand from the black educators mm -hmm. whose work I follow and um from whom I learn indirectly yeah. is that in the black community the phrase they killed the Jews they killed Jesus sorry <laughs> refers just generically to betrayal oh and if you're I have a very, my, I have some religious studies and I have very deep um, training in Christianity and Judaism as well, like uh, academic wise. So I happen to know, I happen to have the academic background to, uh, to know that um, they killed Jesus refers to on the temple, uh, on the Mount, when there were the three crosses and the Ro Romans said to the crowd gathered, the crowd of Jews gathered, yeah. which one should we kill? Is it the thief? I think his name was Barabbas. Was it the other dude or is it Jesus? And, and the crowd is supposed to have chanted, crucify him, crucify him. And the crowd was Jews and they were chanting, crucify Jesus. So Christians for eternity have believed that the Jews killed Jesus. So the they killed Jesus historically refers to Jews, but it has been in the black community if i'm understanding the educators again there could be room for i want to say like i may have misunderstood what they said but my understanding is 
that it became divorced of that context and just referred to betrayal in general. And Jamie Foxx stated, I'm, I was referring to a friend who betrayed me. Now that right. I know, like I'm paraphrasing what he said, now that yeah. I know that it's, a, it's an, it's an anti-Semitic, it, that it's been used to harm Jews, I'm not gonna use the phrase anymore. And, and that it totally makes sense to me in that, because I'm thinking <laughs> as a Catholic going, that's not really an everyday expression that you would use. That's like you're, right. it, when again, I hear it, I only hear it from people who have anti-Semitic mindsets. Right. And, and I, I'm, I'm like, dude, it was like 2000 years ago. Seriously. Like, are we still like, and it was like maybe six, 10 people. Like, how did this get so out of context in my mind? But again, mm -hmm. I, I, I but you definitely see, I come have from no a insight. very privileged background. Like we've right? established this. I didn't I go to black church. Way, yes, right? exactly. You went to Catholic church. I went to a uh, 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 synagogue services. He, he grew up in the black community that went to black church. Um, yeah. And maybe he didn't go to black church, but that's where the, that's the context, right? Right. And I didn't know that that was the context, just like you didn't know that that was the context, right? So, yeah. so all three of us have three very potentially different meanings of this and the, and the gravitas with which that statement has. And I, I think too, that this has happened a lot in kind of recent times of when people are getting kind of ousted for, for their behavior is to understand the context in which somebody is trying to express themselves. Mm -hmm. And we very frequently will use flippant language to be mm -hmm. able to, to get across a very complex point because mm -hmm. we don't think we have the time or the wherewithal to be able to, to express. It's kind of like in computer tech, everybody uses acronyms for everything because to have a conversation with using the full words, people forget what they were talking about in the first place, right? So it's, it's the same thing that happens is we don't in society use acronyms necessarily to explain our thoughts, but we will use these, these phrases that we expect that people have the same understanding of it. Yeah, I agree. I, it was kind of funny. My brother said to his wife one time, get off my back. And she's not English as a first language. So she's like, I'm not on your back. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not even in the same part of the room as you are right now what are you talking about <laughs> it never even occurred to me that somebody would take that expression as literal mm -hmm. but they just never used it before so in understanding that that we have this whole global community and maybe that's where this um it feels like people are being more offended than ever by everything is because we have a global community now much more so than we have ever had before and not only with in every country within every state within every city within every family we have a different comprehension and understanding of what any given word means let alone kind of the when the emotions fly that we don't have the the patience to actually hear what somebody's saying from their point of view we're hearing it from our point of view yeah, I think I think it's two things. I think it's the degree of exposure is much larger, mm -hmm. but I also think um, the tolerance for bullshit is getting smaller. People are just not willing to put up with shit anymore. I mean, when you were a serf working under the under the the lord of the manor, you know, like there was a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of shit, and you really could not look up from the day to day for the most part. People tried. There were many, many, many attempts to organize mm -hmm. and to change people's conditions. But um, the more resourced you are, the more capable you are of lifting your head up and saying, oh, fuck this shit, I'm not doing it anymore. And we're gonna, and, and I have the capacity to organize. You know what, the most powerful, one of the most powerful movies about this to me is um, Norma Ray, mm. where it shows the toll of organizing, what it does to this day to organize to a person, to their life, to their livelihood, to their mental health, to their relationships and their families, it takes an enormous toll to speak up and to act, uh, act for change. And so I think that the fact that we have more and more and more capacity now um, means that we are more able to speak up and act for change where, you know, in the 1600s, people weren't, people just what didn't. Have? Yeah. Well, and I do find it particularly fascinating that there are still so many areas that I would have thought by now would have been like rested and buried that are still very much alive and on fire. 
which is mind boggling to me. Um, like of which there are numerous ones. So let's look at it from a, a personal perspective. Somebody listening to this right here, right now, what can they do to be able to empower themselves in that? Hey, if I stand up for myself, somebody's going to be offended by it and I'm okay with that. And when somebody else is offended by the things I do, it's to have the compassion and understanding of where are they coming from with that? And like, I can't be apologetic for everything that's ever happened to them in their life. And that's not what we're talking about, but to say, Hey, it's, I didn't mean it the way you took it. And how do we have that conversation? Well, I would, I would, I would say, first of all, I would really invite folks never to use the phrase. I didn't mean it the way you took it because <laughs> yeah, never say that. <laughs> your intention just does not mean anything. Harm is harm is harm is harm. Harm is harm. And, and the person is trying to bring to your attention that you have caused harm, whether you intended to cause harm or not. And the first thing, especially a person in a position of power, like let's say a white person speaking to a black person and the black person has said, you hurt me by what you did. And the white person goes, well, I didn't mean to, is a white person's way of getting off the hook. And what we have to do across the board, like I'm Jewish, but I pass for white. I have access to a great deal of white privilege. I'm also finan economically privileged, right? I'm also cisgender privileged. And so um, it's, it's for me to take responsibility for the harm that has happened through me personally, not for every white person on the earth, just me mm -hmm. personally in this moment when somebody says you've caused harm to me, that for me to say, oh, thank you for telling me, please tell me more, I want to understand before I make excuses. If we're doing a whole process, then eventually there's a, there's a dialogue where you, the person I've harmed may have the capacity to hear what was happening for me when I did the thing that harmed them. But that's part of the dialogue later on. The first thing is just don't even, don't even talk about your intentions. Just say, oh, thank you for telling me. Please help me understand, tell me more. I want to know more. I wanna connect with you more. But to come back to your question uh, about what people can do, to be able to do any of this kind of work around staying solid in yourself, and which means not being offended by others in quotation marks and not offending others in quotation marks is this, this idea of being resourced. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the self-compassion work by Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, -F, to be in right relationship with yourself means that then you don't have shame or you're less likely to have shame attacks when someone lets you know you've harmed them. And then when you don't have a shame attack, you have a capacity to engage in the conversation with them. The second thing is in terms of resourcing, being resourced is uh, for speaking up for yourself, but also when someone speaks up to you is to have a community of support that shares your values so that when you are shaken, you can go to the support go to the community, get resourced so that you can withstand the, um, like it makes me think of like a lightning strike, you know, and how all the little uh, electric shocks goes bzz, 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 right. And, and for the structure to withstand that, to go all the way through, it has to have like strong footings. It, the rivets have to be strong. The material has to be strong. That's like your community of support for you to be able to take the quote unquote hit you have to have people with you and behind you. Brene Brown talks about this in the Dare to, Dare to Lead process. And I would really recommend that folks look into Brene Brown's Dare to Lead materials because that she talks at length about the importance of community and support and lays out kind of what it looks like. So those are the two things, you know, get, get a right relationship with yourself, a supportive relationship with yourself, do the work that that takes and have a supportive community. I love it. So I know people are going to want to hear from more from you. How do they start that journey with you? Sure. The best place is to connect with me by my newsletter through my newsletter, which is shula.ca slash newsletter. You'll put the link, of course. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn, search my name and or Instagram. I'm the entrepreneur's therapist. I love to be in the DMs with folks. So I'm happy to hear, um, you know, if you have, uh, you want to connect with me, you can just, you know, shoot me a, a message on one of those platforms. Awesome. I love it. So we will, of course, have all of your links in the show notes. So peeps, just scroll down, open it up in a new browser, of course, because we're not done yet. So Sheila, you've been absolutely amazing. Any last words for our peeps? 
Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, you know, the nature of the work that I do, I talk more about uh, mental health and entrepreneurship, and this is not separate, but this is like something, as you can probably tell, that I was so passionate about, so passionate about, and I'm just really glad that you gave me the platform <laughs> to talk about it more. So thank you, Michelle. Absolutely. And I totally appreciate that every conversation you get into isn't going to have equal gravitas. Sometimes we get triggered in the middle of an elevator when you get five seconds and sometimes it's in our intimate relationships. And unfortunately, our intimate relationships, we get a lot of chance to practice. But if you're listening to this and you are struggling with mental health issues, of course, reach out to somebody, get help with that immediately. You have a huge support group, tons of love on the planet, and we want all the best for you. So please take care of that. And thank you again, uh, Shula, for being here with us today. Thanks. Peeps, thank you for being here with us today. Be sure to subscribe to the show, share it with your friends. We love helping you find a place in this world.